first Just Transition team. So the first Just Transition campaign happened. We called it the Just Transition campaign. That's when we worked with Jose Bravo from the Just Transition Alliance, um, whose work is around bringing together communities who are impacted by toxic facilities and the workers of those toxic facilities to, instead of being against each other, to work together to try and create something better. So that's, that's how we started in Just Transition work. Um, and it was about when the Mojave Generating Station was shut down, we went after the California Public Utilities Commission, who there was a bunch of money tied up in that uh, power plant um, through sulfur dioxide trading system. I won't get into that. But what would have happened when it shut down is millions of dollars would just go back to whoever they're, the owners of the plants were. And we intervened and said, no, you've received cheap electricity and cheap water for over 30 years. You owe it to the Navajo and Hopi people to help us to transition our economy. And that was what our first campaign was in 2006. Seven years later, <laughs> um, a decision was made. So 2013, um, the California Public Utilities Commission ruled in our favor to take that money and put it into a revolving loan fund that would help Navajo and Hopi to develop solar projects. Do our tribes use those? Not a question. And we, our tribes aren't, our tribe ain't doing anything. Can we pass some legislation? Can we pass some laws to get our tribal government to do something? So our second phase of Just Transition was around building the foundation on the Navajo nationwide scale to push, at that time, a green economy, restorative economy. Um, so in 2000, so we did a lot of works around doing a bunch of events across the reservation called Green Awareness Days, like what do we mean by renewable, what do we not mean, nuclear power is not renewable, you know, things like that, um, and doing a bunch of events, and this was like, in 2009-ish, around there, 2008-2009. We did a partnership with Northern Arizona University where we did climate change education in elementary schools across the reservation in Northern Arizona. We developed an incubator, a partnership with Northern Arizona Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology, NASET, and Flagstaff to create an incubator for Navajo people who wanted to start green businesses. And in 2009, we passed the Navajo Nation Green Economy Commission and fund legislation, which was to create a budget line item in our tribal government's budget to start to fund projects for an that would oversee that. So trying to get those things in our tribal government. Yay, we passed it in 2009. Does our tribe do anything with it? <laughs> no. Right, unfortunately. So every success we get, we're like, oh, okay, now there's something else we gotta do. So that was our second phase. We're like, okay, no one's doing anything with this. Our tribe's not creating any projects. They're not providing any pilot projects. I guess we gotta do that too. So our third phase of Just Transition was trying to prove that this economy would work through experimentation. And we had three projects, solar, wool, and food sovereignty. Now, and this is kind of, this is when I joined the organization was around this phase. So the solar project. Our original idea was of, was to create all on all the all the all the lands in Black Mesa who had gone through mining um, to transition that into a large scale solar project. And we said, hey, um, all the infrastructure is already there. They've already gone through all of the different like archaeological reviews and things for that area. We can put solar panels there while the land is recovering. Perfect idea, right? Um, we could create 6,000 megawatts of electricity. It could create, create 300 to 3,000 well-paying operational jobs. It could create 700 to 38,000 temporary jobs. It could bring in 35.6 million to 357 million dollars a year to the regional economy, and an additional 85.4 million to 4 billion a year in construction. Plus, it had all the ideal conditions, like we have good solar potential in that area. So that was our original idea. In the end, in two summers ago, I think, our first solo project is a seven kilowatt system on Forest Lake Chapter House. <laughs> yay, yay, yay. <laughs> but what a big difference, right? We learned a lot by trying to, to starting out on this big scale. We went around to all different communities 
And of course, people were like, oh, okay, so now I gotta, now that the mining's done, I gotta now give my lands over to a solar project, and money's gonna go to the tribe, but then eventually it's gonna come back down to me. They were suspicious. Hey, it makes sense to me. And I'm like, no, you're right. That's so right. All right, let's scale it back. Let's talk about, um, let's approach some families who have good land near substations, and we could, like, break it up into different pieces for people who opt into it. So we went around, did a lot of presentations with families. I remember one Christmas when everybody's home around the Christmas season, we were doing presentations, talking to these people. Hey, we could put this many kilowatts in your land if you're open to it. You'll get paid this much. It'll come directly to you and your family. It was like opening a can of worms. It was like what I observed was the non-Navajo in-laws like, oh, starting to take over everything. Um, we saw the relatives from Phoenix being like, no, when we come home, we don't want to see solar panels. We saw the people there being like, well, you live in Phoenix anyway. So it was just creating arguments. <laughs> and we were not prepared for that. So we're like, OK, let's back off again. Let's put, um, go to senior centers, schools, hospitals, the community spaces, chapter houses, and see if any of them um, want to start to have solar in their area so then it could benefit communities equally as opposed to this family, this clan, you know what I mean? Um, and so that's how we ended up with the seven kilowatt system at Forest Lake Chapter House, including the first Tesla power wall in the state of Arizona. So there's many, 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 many lessons learned from this. And what spun off is a company called Native Renewables. I don't know if you have heard of it. It's run by two Dinap women out of the Bay Area who are awesome. Wahela is one of our former staff members. And they're really about addressing the 18,000 homes on Navajo that have no electricity. So it's really changed from let's do a big industrial scale project that our tribal government will run to like how do we actually give people who need electricity electricity. So it's not about selling electricity to Los Angeles. It's about providing our own people with our own needs. <laughs> we, you're gonna have to regulate on me on time. I'm okay. <laughs> um, so our second project was around wool. So again, I'm gonna talk about Wahela. So Wahela helped her grandma shear her sheep. It took a week. Um, they had a truck bed full of wool. They drove it from Forest Lake into Gallup, New Mexico, border town, to sell it. Um, how much money do you think they got? So a week's worth of work between two people, driving two hours to sell it, um, one truck bid, how much money do you think they got for that? One dollar? A hundred? A hundred dollars? Anybody else? A hundred and fifty dollars, five hundred? Eighteen dollars. <laughs> I wish she was telling us this and we were like, what? We had the same reaction as you guys. And we're like, this someone is making money. But it's not us. So how do we get that money back to the wool producers? So we did research, figured out where all the Navajo wool went after it went to border towns, created relationships with buyers, brought them to the Navajo res, did trainings for people, gave them materials to um, help them, you know, shear their sheep, skirting tables, um, told them, just gave them training to help them to get a prior, higher price, and now we, and then we brought in the buyers to buy it from them. Our first little buy was in 2012. It took place in Pinon, Arizona. It was about 15,000 pounds of wool, so like $13,000 to the regional economy, and 10 families participated in the trainings. We just finished our seventh annual wool buy last week? The time is flying. I think it was last week. Um, I don't have the numbers for that one yet, but in 2017, our sixth wool buy, we started with 15,000 pounds, remember, we sold 123,765 pounds of wool. We made maybe $12,000 for people the first year. Last year, people got spent 70, got $73,262 directly to the wool producers, not to the border towns. The training is making the quality of wool improving and becoming more consistent. And we're also, we've done a lot of um, quizzes or um, not quizzes, surveys with them to find out like where's there a lot of wool on the reservation, where can infrastructure be built. We're developing products. 
and more wool producers and buyers want to participate. We actually get calls from people like, hey, can we participate in your wool buy? And like, it depends how much you're going to pay people, right? Because before, people could get paid 10 cents a pound, 25 cents a pound, maybe, for the wool. And we've gotten it up to 75 cents a pound, for some, even up to $1.25 a pound. So it's good. It's awesome. Our third project is a food sovereignty project. So we grow food on 13 acres of land um, in the Pinyon region, and, um, and we just experiment. So there's no um, irrigation. We're trying to figure out how to use the natural landscapes and watersheds and to restore those watersheds so they can flow into fields and grow food. Um, in addition to that, our 13 acres, so this is a learning center. People come, we teach them how we do things. Um, we grow food and we share food with the community to the senior centers and different families around. In addition to that, we've done a food assessment. We were like, oh, we're going to do all of Black Mesa and figure out how much food potential there is. You know, easy, we'll do it in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> so we did one community off of Black Mesa called Blue Gap. And with that, we surveyed and mapped 130 fields, totaling 947 acres of potential farming lands just in that one community. We conducted interviews with 108 elders and farmers, and we've restored 28 fields in addition to our own. Um, we've also engaged in policy, so we're doing policy and campaign development. We've passed non-GMO non-GMO seeds in the region, in, in Black Mesa region, um, and we're continuing to, do, to build policy with other partners on that nation. So yeah, skipping, skipping, skipping. Many lessons learned from us. We must meet communities where they're at, like with the solar project. Money helps, but it's not the answer or the solution. In fact, it can cause a lot of problems. We must provide for the direct needs of our people. How can we get our people food, electricity, water? Nah, and, and more money, sure, but the way things are going, we're never going to catch up. We're never going to be able to afford things, right? Things are just going to become more and more and more and more expensive. So we can provide people with money, definitely, but if that's our ultimate goal, we're going to always be chasing that. We're always going to be chasing that, and we're never going to reach it. So how can we actually provide people with the things that they need? without having to have the money as the in-between those things. That's really our goal. We must build from our traditional values and teachings. Movement building matters and or movements don't mean organizations. So we're one organization, we're a nonprofit, but a lot of the people that we work with are not nonprofits and they don't have to be. <laughs> they don't have to be. They're still doing the work. And how can we support those two? Partnership does not mean paternalism and or pick your partnerships wisely. <laughs> Uh, a lot of you I saw are like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I don't think I need to explain that. It's all related, so just transition does mean, sure, coal to renewable, but it also means things like, how do we bring back the matriarchy? That's my own personal yes. favorite. There's a lot more to just transition. And healing is key, and or unlearning is as important as learning. So we're in our fourth phase of Just Transition, which is really about restoring our culture with our resources. So we're doing a lot of work on decolonization and unlearning, as I said, practicing our culture. So um, uh, learning the Nebuzah, practicing our values like that, sustainability, localization, resiliency, youth leadership support, organizing infrastructure, and movement building and alignment among all of the different peoples who are doing work on the Navajo Nation. So last fall, um, so our crew built a hogan, a traditional male hogan near Sisna Jinnah, which is an eastern mountain of the Diné, as a place for young people to go and learn and make offerings and do things. So we made an offering there this spring. We made an offering in our South Mountain last weekend, again? <laughs> We've been on the go. Um, but, and, and people might say, what does doing an offering have to do with the Navajo Generating Station? <laughs> we can get that question, but for us, like that's what empowers people. I think people are, our people are tired of hearing all the bad things that happen to them. We're like, hey, guess what? Here's another thing that's going to just ruin you and pollute you. It's, you know, you can only say that to, to people for so long. How do we make people happy? How do we make people 
be proud? How can we keep people from feeling afraid and, and angry only, you know? And that's gonna come through practicing our culture and our teachings and learning and being open. Um, so that's it, I'm gonna end there. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Jahan. And if, if nothing else, I hope you got the point about just transition is not something that happens overnight. It's a very long-term <laughs> process, long-term thinking. If there are any funders here, <laughs> I hope that you understand that it's uh, we work we work so hard to do qualitative work over quantitative work. And it takes time to do that, build a really good and solid foundation, as Jahan clearly um, it showed us during this. And so thank you so much for that. Um, and we're going to uh, continue on with our final panelists before we open up for questions at the end here with Melina. Melina Lubakan Massimo, a good friend of mine. I don't know if you were here earlier. It's also Melina's birthday today. <laughs> I'm gonna keep reiterating that. Uh, Melina's been very, very, very busy. She, I, I remember I was like, Melina, what should I put for your title now? And uh, she texted me and I was like, whoa, okay, cool. I'll, I'll, say, all, I'll say all these things. <laughs> <laughs> she's been working with Lubukan Cree Solar in her community, but she's also a David Suzuki fellow, and she's also a TV show host for Power to the People and has been on location internationally recording and doing her, her shows. I was just uh, watching, I think it was CNN last Sunday or something, and I was like, that's Melina. <laughs> She's on TV. <laughs> so if you get a chance to check out um, Power to the People, she is the host, so give it up for Melina. It's an honor and privilege to be here in Nisqually territory and I thank the organizers for organizing this and the ho local host nation for allowing us to be here in their homelands in this very um, epic historical place. So it's um, really a privilege to be here with you all on my birthday. <laughs> I, this is a cool way to celebrate. Um, last year I was with my dad at actually in ceremony, so this is kind of like ceremony too, I was thinking this morning when I woke up, so um, I'm going to start with a prophecy um, and kind of channel in somebody who I, I take a lot of, um, I've taken a lot of um, inspiration from, which is Winona LaDuke, who wrote amazing Just Transition um, booklets for Indigenous communities many years ago that I read and was like, I'm going to do that. Um, so prophecy speaks at a time during the seventh generation in well-worn, the second path is moon green, and it is our choice as communities and as and our sons. I come from, so my community is, Lil is named Little Buffalo, and my family, we're Lubukon Cree, so we're in Nihiao from the western region of the Tar Sands, so done lots of um, advocacy work that I've been a lot with over the years because we're both from the Tar Sands, and who's been to the Tar Sands? We were talking about just transition, but as you know, it's one of the biggest industrial projects on the planet, and what we're facing is really intense. Um, I grew up going with my Kukum and Muslim on the horse and wagon, and so, you know, this is in the 80s, and um, the all-weather road was built into our territory in 1979, so before I was born, and I remember going in the horse and wagon with my Kukum and Muslim. They didn't speak English, they only spoke Cree. They were very much living off the land. Um, and already employing just transition. It was a beautiful scene. It was a beautiful feeling. I still remember that feeling, and, and that's really why I fight, um, because it was so lush and so green, and just, you know, our family just, in the summer times, would go and live on the land to be there for the summer, so it was just being with the horse and the wagon and just hunting and picking and trapping and, like, picking berries and medicine, so, that's my memories as a, as a young child. And as I got older and older, and would, um, you know, we go to the city or we go to the Spike Lake, and then I come home and we just see like the, the immense amount of cut lines and just all of the, all of the changes that I think a lot of us um, here have seen um, over the years of what's happened to our homelands. And it just, you know, it gets to the point where I would just 
break down in the, in the in the truck with my dad and be so upset with what was happening to our homelands that you know so I just worked so hard trying to protect our homelands and similar to what it was when there was a massive oil spill back home and it was 4.5 million liters it was down a corridor where people pick berries people hunt moose um, and this then beaver dams were completely subsumed like and it was just it was probably one of the most Trump teaches creating the community and has for like 35 years. She was texting me and she's like, can you figure out what's happening from the school? Because we thought maybe it was a propane leak inside the school, but we took them outside and um, they just, like, we can't breathe. It's, it's worse actually out in the open field. And so these are the kind, it doesn't matter, you know, have we done how many tours across into Europe trying to get done? It didn't matter. It just felt like at that point when it was to the point where it was like, my family is suffocating. I, we can't breathe and it doesn't stop ex exploiting our homelands if nothing's changing here and now, if the reality isn't changing today. You know, like I can talk to them blue in the face for five, ten years, which I did. And then um, about mm, five, six years ago, I was like, I need to actually figure out how to teach myself how to put solar up. Alberta in, in, in north of the medicine line is one of the essential. So, you, there was so much, sorry about that, there's so much solar potential implementing and, and putting these projects into our communities and into our homelands. Um, without, you know, if I have to teach myself and teach my community and fundraise by myself and fundraise, um, this was before a lot of funding was available, so, you know, it took a while to fundraise for the project, but it was something that, for me, I'm so happy that I did it. Um, you know, because what we know that climate change um, is, is massive. We have massive forest fires back home in Alberta and in, in so-called BC. There's just immense impacts to our homelands. So, what are the things that are look like for us? You know, in the tar sands, working with, with workers, there's so much um, kind of fighting with tar. You know, when we used to shut down mines and and, and uh, shut down certain. Uh, we'll be and filming stuff. the rest the, the of workers these find my conversations. Somehow, please tune me. in and what are you doing? stay connected yeah, with us throughout the rest of the Protect Mother's okay, conference. You know, no one's going to run over us by the, you know, these, these, um, <coughs> these trucks are like three, three.